Okay, we're live. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Andy Wright. This is Asking for a Friend. This is an initiative by Never Not Creative, uh, Young Bloods, and the Mentally Healthy Change Group. The whole concept of Asking for a Friend exists because we wanted to create a safe place for where you can ask the unaskable. Uh, the questions that you're worried may change the way people treat you at work or affect the opportunities that might be given to you. So we're bringing together industry leaders, mental health professionals, to give you non-judgmental responses in a safe, anonymous environment. Um, you'll see we've got guests in Ant and Erica with us today. I'm going to introduce them uh, in a few seconds. Uh, but first off, a little bit of housekeeping. So um, if you're new to this platform and this event, then um, what you can do is on the right-hand side, you can ask questions in the questions tab. So please get those in. We have a few questions to go through first that were sent in beforehand via the site. Um, but what we really do is encourage questions in that questions tab. So please get them in. And then once you get them in or you see other people put questions in, then uh, you can upvote those questions as well. So make sure that we uh, prioritize them and start asking those first. Also, there are comments and thoughts and stuff you can add into the chat. Um, so if you if you agree with a few things or if you kind of just like nod with agreement or if you've got links to other things that you think other people might find um, helpful, then definitely put those in. Um, obviously, today is fairly sort of informal and casual. And if you need more immediate help and potentially more professional advice, um, then you can also visit mentallyhealthy.org. And we've got a lot of um, different helplines and phone numbers there. I'm just going to pop that into the uh, chat just here. So go visit that if you um, want to find out places where you can get more help. And a caveat that like everything that we do with um, Never Not Creative and Mentally Healthy is volunteer run, and essentially it's unofficial. So we're you know we're a bunch of people using community to come together and tackle the challenges that our industry is facing. So with that in mind, just remember that you know this is anonymous. We don't have the context for your questions. Everyone's situation is different. So hopefully the advice you do get is something to consider, but also that you go off and seek help either professionally or, or casually from other people as well. So, you know, if things are getting very serious for you, you know, you should absolutely seek professional help, whether that's you know financial, legal, or, or mental health related. So with the housekeeping out of the way, it's uh, a real pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Erica Crone. So Erica is a clinical psychologist and health manager with broad expertise in mental health, sleep, continual improvement, project management, digital health and insurance. So quite a lot there. Um, she's passionate about developing evidence-based programs to improve mental health at scale by combining best clinical practice with user-centered design. Um, authored over 20 peer-reviewed publications on mental health and implementation of best practice. Regularly developed content for digital health programs, white papers, awareness campaigns. Uh, lots of letters after your name, I think. We'll get, we'll you can through. leave them. <laughs> um, but yeah, welcome to Asking for a Friend, Eric. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me probably one of our most qualified guests i must i must say um yeah Erica's have, making me feel like an underachiever here it's uh, well i, I feel like a tough no. reading your bio you're way cooler than me aunt <laughs> so we do have aunt aunt melder and is the co-founder and creative partner at a new independent creative agency with a difference coffee cocoa gum powder um, driven by the advertising great George Lois dictum that the accurate measure of a human being is what he or she actually gets done. Passionate about creativity, whatever form it takes and stuff um, he's got done so far includes epic ads, digital and social integrated campaigns and a life-saving porn film. That sounds like a whole event in its own right. Yes, yeah, um, he's run punk fanzines, written articles for GQ, launched a nationwide magazine, had a book published, loves books, boxing, and Bruce Springsteen, and speaks conversational Cantonese. He's won lots of awards, but his biggest thrill is having ideas and helping to build a collaborative culture where they're cherished, championed, and turned into brilliantly crafted reality. Welcome, Ant. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And hello, everyone. They are great introductions. It's very, it's very good to have both of you here with us. Um, so we are going to crank into the questions. Uh, we've got about six questions that have come in beforehand. And uh, like I said, please put your questions um, so that we can answer them live. We'll get to them in about 25 minutes, I expect, um, into the questions tab. So uh, this is a great opportunity for you. So first, I'm going to come to you, Erica. Um, First question is, we all have our moments, but I've noticed during lockdown and prolonged periods of home working that people are generally less positive and lighthearted. 
this seems to be contagious and groups of people stir each other up, really convincing themselves that the company is just the worst place. I've had those feelings, but then snap out of it and realize how bloody lucky I am. I don't know how best to snap people out of this negative cycle. This includes people up and down the levels of the business. So how can we help people snap out of this negativity? Well, it's probably worth kind of looking at where it comes from. And there's probably two angles to look at it. First is humans are really context dependent. So if everyone around us is having a terrible time, it tends to influence how we see things. So we tend to look to other people for our signals of how we should feel and how we should respond. So if you've got everyone around you kind of telling you things are terrible, it tends to bring your mood down a little bit. The other thing kind of going on at a more individual level is probably the fact that how we feel can have a real influence over how our brain works. So what we know from research is that if people feel depressed, they're more likely to pay attention to really negative things in their environment. They actually go back in time and remember the more negative things that have happened in their life. Similar with anxiety, if you're really worried about something, you tend to spot lots of danger signs in your environment. You tend to remember all the times you couldn't handle things. So kind of with the response of what you should do probably kind of takes both of those into account. So some of it is you being a kind of catalyst for change in your group by just kind of calling out what you see. Hey, guys, you know, I've noticed that we're kind of getting in this loop. And we keep talking about some really negative things and it tends to bring us all down and I don't think it's helping any of us. Um, you know, offer solutions like maybe we should try and balance it out for every negative thing, thing we talk about. Let's talk about something we can do differently or we could change. Or how about, you know, we stop the conversation when it starts getting onto this cycle and we just kind of go off and, and do our own thing. It's probably also trying to contain the damage of some of that for you. So limiting the amount of time you're in those kind of conversations or balancing it out by um, spending time with people who do lift you up a little bit, not scrolling lots of negative news feeds. Because I think a lot of the information around us right now just gets a little bit overwhelming. So um, you're obviously doing a great job kind of pulling yourself out of it in those moments. And perhaps you can be one of the kind of key people that help other people do that as well. I don't yeah. know, Ant. Anything anything different or new on top of that? Uh, it's not, uh, maybe not that different. I mean, the first thing I'd say is, um, yeah, what Erica said, I would do that. That's, uh, yeah, that's, um, that's the first. All of that I heartily endorse for sure. Um, I suppose it, it, uh, probably the same thing, but in my words, I'd say um, stay connected. Don't, you know, try not to be too isolated. Don't kind of lock yourself away. I mean, you know, although that's probably most of that has to be kind of over virtual rather than real life. It, I think it's really important to stay connected. You, you talked about people there, Erica. I think, um, I, I think for me, whether it's um, pandemic or not, just being around people that energize you and, uh, you know, make you feel good versus people that are, ne you know, a negative influencer, just seek those people out and, um, and, and spend time, you know, as I say, whether it's virtually or, or in reality around those people and, and projects as well, the people in the projects that just uh, like energize you and excite you. Um, and then I think just when you are spending that time with people, because a lot of the time you may be, you, you may be kind of uh, locked away working uh, solo, um, just try to use that solo time, that flexible working time when you're not, if you're not having to be in the office to your best advantage. So rather than getting stuck at the kitchen table for hours and hours and hours on end, make sure you, you're really kind of quite disciplined about making sure you get a break and you go for a walk and you, you know, you go and do, uh, you go and do other stuff that feeds your soul, whether, you know, whether that's nice food or, you know, sneaking off to the cinema or whatever it may be. And the reason I say that is that then when you do spend time around people and projects that excite you, then you can bring your best self and not get into that negative kind of um, downward spiral. It's tough, isn't it? Because it is a spiral. And also, like, if you're starting to have those negative thoughts, you then you, you kind of start seeking them out or you notice them quicker, right? Like, you, you it's almost... Um, that it kind of backs up your opinion that everyone's being being negative. Um, and the next question mm. is for you. Uh, so this is a sort of management and leadership question. Um, I was recently promoted and moved to another department, which I never saw coming. Management confirmed this is basically on my performance, even though I hadn't completed two years with the business when the promotion happened. Management seemed happy with my performance, but the employees working for me seemed to act like I'm a threat. Currently, I'm struggling between old colleagues that feel I was promoted and they were not, and current colleagues that feel threatened by me overseeing processes. 
how do I handle this difficulty? Yeah, so it's a really good question, isn't it? It's kind of, I think the, um, the way I sort of verbalise this in my mind, we were just chatting before we came on, Andy, was uh, how, do you, how do you cure imposter syndrome is, is kind of a good part of this. Um, and particularly in this in the creative business, there's a lot lot of it specifically because I think um, when you come into the, the creative business as a creative, um, as you progress and you get better at what you do and maybe, you, you know, you achieve some things, you eventually get promoted to a point where you're less of a doing a purely creative role and maybe your creative director, which is, is much more on the, the people management side than it is, uh, you know, coming up with ideas or, you know, or crafting ideas. Um, and, and a lot of the time, uh, many of us, most of us probably are not really properly prepared or trained for this completely new role. So suddenly, you know, you're, you're thrown in sort of managing people and some of the politics that this, this, the person that asked this question is talking about, how do you do that? Um, I would say, um, the main thing for me would be, the work like just try and really focus on the work rather than the politics the, the minute you get sucked into all the politics and the negativity that the, the the person asking the question has talked about that can be really hard if you if you focus on the work um, and then prove yourself through the work the good work that you can do and that you can um, empower the team around you the people you're talking about to do um, if you can uh, you can realize that you know you you don't need to take credit but you can now give credit you don't need to take all the opportunities you can give those opportunities um, I think that's um, I mean I think another way of saying that is like it's kind of like don't be a dick just uh, you know let let sort of let go and uh, give other other people those things and I think that will that will kind of earn your respect um, and I think it's just um for me, it was uh, when I was in this sort of um, situation in my life. It was uh, just a mind uh, a mindset switch because because I sort of said it was two different jobs. I think you have to get, learn from um, learn to go from being a being a player on the field to being a manager, or maybe even a player manager to start with, and then a manager. It's like how do you let go of kind of doing everything and try and get to the point where you're getting you know you you're allowing others to do it and you're giving people the autonomy they need. Um, there was a really good. Um, I don't know if many people are sort of soccer fans that are on at the moment. I'm, I'm, I see every. I see the world in um, soccer metaphors. So this one sort of really helped for me. It was like just to sort of um, put yourself in this new perspective. Um, there was a brilliant player for Liverpool years ago um, when I was younger, young, called uh, Kenny Dalglish, like a classic um, Liverpool player. And he kind of was such a great player and then captain that then he became player manager and then manager. And for a couple of seasons, he would put himself in the team now and then. Um, and then eventually he kind of he wasn't in the team he was just picking the team and uh, at the time when he was player manager he just said uh, when people are asking him about how he kind of manages to sort of step away is he on the field or is he not he said um, I know I have the right the right team and the right balance and, and yeah the team's just right when I can't get into the team um, and I thought that was just a good like a, a way of just kind of sort of knowing that your, your role is different now and uh, you're not necessarily on the field, but you need to give the people that are on the field the space to do what they're good at and the, you know, the things they need, um, which I suppose is like that sort of let, letting go in a way. Um, and I think like if you can kind of do that mind shift and sort of work in that way, then great work comes out of it. And I think in this business, great work kind of solves every problem. Once people, it's like a, it's like a drug in this business. Once people are, are doing great work and uh, enjoying the work they're doing and the work's getting credit and so on, then all of the, all of the poli politics kind of go, go away to a degree. Yeah, great. What do you, you want to add, Erica? What do you think, Erica? Yeah, well, I, I know that and we've talked about this a little bit before, but being a manager is kind of a complete new skill set in mm. and of itself. So I think that what makes you technically brilliant and kind of what you got promoted for is actually not what you need to be using in this role a lot of the time. So being a really good manager um, is less around telling people what to do and more about creating an environment and a, a work system and accountability system that lets them do their best work, as, as Ant was saying. So I think things like managing dynamics, managing communications, managing relationships within your team is now part of your job mm -hmm. and it's something that's really important. Um, so I'd kind of say get a, get a mentor who can work with you on your management style and your leadership style in the same way you'd get feedback and um, work on your technical skills as well. And I think kind of looking at how you're helping your identity and your relationships shift. So I think as sad as it is, it, it is hard to have the same relationship that you had with your 
colleagues when you're now a manager and they're not and things need to change and I think really radical open conversations around what you're noticing and how you're feeling can help some of that shift but it's also probably making sure that you are kind of getting those connections outside work as well to help give you the reality check so I think when your whole reality is inside work and the dynamics in work you kind of lose perspective and um Yes, I think making sure that you're getting that sense check and the support and those really good relationships outside work to help you navigate what is always a little bit of a bumpy patch. Yeah, I was just going to say, Erica, just something something you said that really resonated with me that, yeah, that I, I sort of forgot to say. I think it's a really good point. Um, mentors, like having a mentor has always, always, always helped me because I'm getting from this question, certainly from my, my experiences in, in my career, um, when these kind of things come up, these sort of situations come up it can be quite lonely because you've gone from being in a group to being sort of elevated to something that's um you know there's there's other things on your mind and there's things you can't talk about and you cut suddenly can't share it because people have got a different um it's a different context and i've always found having a mentor that you trust throughout has been has been really really helpful for that yeah definitely yeah that's great advice um okay erica next question is for you where can you go for help if your boss and mentor is sexually harassing you at work? It's a lot more common than I think we realize. And if you don't know where to turn, it can be really overwhelming, especially when your coworkers haven't supported or stood up for you. Yeah, I was just going to go, it doesn't follow on nicely from our conversation about no, get no a mentor. Man. Don't get that mentor. Um, but I really feel for you, this stuff is not okay. Um, and it's, you know, it's actually against the law, like your workplace has a responsibility to protect you from some of this stuff. Um, so I think it's, I mean, this is an important thing to raise and it's important thing to make sure you're really getting supported in the process. I think, um, Andy, we talked a little bit about this um, jumping on. Probably the first place to make sure you've checked off is just that you've flagged that. And, and how you're feeling because sometimes people just don't even realise that the way they're communicating and the way they're interacting is actually really offensive. So I think first out of the gate is making sure you've actually kind of called it out and said that you're not comfortable with what they're doing. Um, it's also important that if you're not getting that support from your manager and they're continuing that behaviour, make sure that you're actually reporting it to someone who's senior enough to help deal with it and kind of can help you navigate it. So depending on the size of your organisation and what kind of stuff they've got in place, there's normally policies around how you manage that stuff, so it's worth brushing up on some of those things, talking to either someone in HR or your manager's manager about what's going on. Um, it's one of those things that there's lots of steps that you can escalate, but I think making sure you're conducting yourself in a really professional manner is important. So it doesn't turn into like a character assassination on, on both sides and really making sure that you're getting support in this process. So it's particularly when you're not getting the support from your team, it can really make you kind of second guess yourself. It can make you doubt yourself. So whether it's trusted friends or even calling up um, helplines like 1-800-RESPECT, that's kind of what they do for their bread and butter is help people talk this through, find next steps, get support when they are going through that process. So um yeah but it's it's not okay and it and it's not not right for this to be happening in the workplace and it does require some some action it's my very hard line stance there Ant. have you got yeah. anything else yeah. no 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 i mean this is definitely one that i kind of would say yeah um everything that erica said there totally totally do that i, I personally i feel sort of uh, totally out of my depth on this question so i definitely i mean it's depressing. It's disgusting. It, it's not okay. Um, my main my main thing would be don't not do anything or don't do nothing. Just don't, don't let that fester. Don't like you can't let that happen and mm. you know let that happen to you. You have to do something. And the things I think you need to do is, is what you just said, Erica. You know, the seeking the help, taking the right steps, and so on. But um, yeah, my main thing would be like don't say, don't do nothing. Don't stand for it. Don't stay silent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think like it's one of those things, isn't it, that, you know, how people take different things can be different from individual to individual. And, you know, if you if you don't speak up, like the, the worst that's going to happen is just going to keep going. 
Um, and so it can only get better by doing something. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, you've got to be able to, to, to take action around that and find people that can support you. Like, you know, like Erica said, we've, I've just put the uh, link to the helpline in the, in the yeah. chat as well. So I think being realistic that it's, you know, it's not great that it's happening and it will probably be a little bit stressful in going through that process, but the stress doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means that you should really be getting support as you go through that process as well. Yeah, 100%. All right, Ant, um, so this is someone new about to come into our industry. Um, when all we are hearing is bad news about the economy, rising unemployment numbers, how do you stay positive as a student knowing that the job market will be more competitive than ever on graduation? Yeah, God, that's, yeah, I really feel for you. It's a really tough time to be coming into the industry. So, I mean, my main bit, I, I, I was going to break this, this answer down into two pieces. One is kind of like how you should... Um, how you should be feeling and then maybe how you might address it and what you might do about it. So um, as you, as you well know, this, it's really competitive to get into this industry. It always has pandemic, always has been pandemic or not. Um, it's just even harder now. Um, so I think the first thing I do is like take the pressure off yourself, totally take the pressure off yourself, be realistic. It's always been hard to get in. It's always been like kind of only the sort of the, whatever percent that can get in the, the door and now there's less opportunities it's going to be even harder so just be realistic about what's achievable um you know give yourself a realistic amount of time to do it give yourself a plan b don't don't sort of um all of your eggs don't need to be in this basket and um and like you know you you you, you failed or whatever if you can't make it because it's just yeah it is really hard right now um having said that um look if you really want to do this and this is kind of what you think your life is, you know, what you're here to do, um, then, you know, you've always needed to be creative to get into the creative industry. So now is the time to, to really get creative. This is your biggest brief and your biggest opportunity. Um, uh, just, you know, you're not, you're probably not going to get into the industry um, from where you are, you know, on graduation with a couple of emails and, and that's it. You need to, as ever, just be really creative. Like how are you going to get, my attention or people's attention how you know what's different about you how are you going to accent accentuate what's different um i think always like the differences have always been really important to me um i'm um people are probably sick of me saying this but i'm the i think i'm the only bangladeshi cockney creative director in the industry i've been sort of down dining out on that for for many years but it's just an example of i think what like you need to like be in touch with what makes you different and what's going to help you stand out and then really accentuate that and get that in front of people um because I, the other thing is when i'm looking for when, you know when people not just me when people are looking for um new grads or you know new young creatives to bring into the industry um i'm asking myself uh what has this person got that i don't really already have in my department and, you know and there's some good people and there's some talented people and they can do things but like what can you bring what's special and different about you that that, that uh, creative directors might not already have and ca how can you kind of really dial that up so that people kind of go oh right okay they've got you know this thing that i haven't got um that's one thing and then in terms of i was just going to throw a couple of examples in terms of being creative um uh, i noticed in the uk when the pandemic started and the the furlough situation uh, people were be getting let go from jobs and being furloughed and so on. Um, there was an agency of more senior. Uh, there was a bunch of senior creative that, that got furloughed, put on the furlough scheme. And they basically got together and created an, an agency called Not Furlong, as in not if you are <laughs> long, um, and sort of set up this temporary mini agency where they would take briefs and, uh, you know, and just pull their skills together and say, look, we're here, we're senior, we've got great skills. Like, what, can we help with your briefs? I thought it was a really kind of uh, interesting, creative way to attack it um there's also one in the, another one i think this is in the uk as well some um some grads have just finished um one of the uh the kind of creative schools over there and they've looked around like your question sort of alludes to and kind of gone oh god how are we going to get a job in this environment um so they've sort of they've just started their own agency it's an agency of interns basically they've said look we can't get a job with your agency we're starting our own intern agency and um, just don't don't give us a job give us a brief and we'll prove to you what we can do so um i just encourage you to yeah those two things really number one just take the pressure off yourself a little bit you know it is hard for everyone and it's going to be harder than it was before so um you know just you don't have to get a job in the next you know in the next um five minutes 
um, as long as you can get by and sort of stay in the game, I would just I'd do that. And then while I'm doing while you were doing that, I just think of like what's a really creative way to to what the really creative ways to make yourself stand out, to be different, to accentuate what's different and special about you. What do you think, Erica? It's my turn to say everything he said. Um, <laughs> so I think yeah, it's it's just really important. I think it, it's easy to get overwhelmed with the magnitude of it all, and I think it is genuinely a really tough time for a lot of people coming into new roles but it's also one of the most important times to kind of focus on what you can control instead of worrying about all the things that are out of your control so as Ant said you know what skills can you brush on how how can you refine your kind of individual value proposition to to market out um but also just kind of really mentally zoom out and kind of picture this as a point in time that even though we're living it and it really feels you know endless right now in the history books it's probably going to be a couple of years at the at the top so these things do change they do recover this is not going to be forever so being able to kind of mentally zoom in and out of time is actually really important and again it's probably just controlling or curating a bit of your contact with the outside world so if you read every article about jobs being kind of nothing and no opportunities for young people or students, then that will start to become your narrative. So it, it might be time to switch off, stop scrolling through the news and then kind of focus on what you can do to increase your chances. Mm. There's, 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 there's never been loads of jobs doing this thing. Like they never, yeah. you know, not now, not ever. But having said that, there's always been jobs, opportunities for really talented, different um, different thinkers. So like, you know, there's always not enough, and there, but there will always be opportunities. Yeah, and it's the, the averages is different to your personal circumstances. So whilst there might be unemployment across the board, it, that's not that does, it's not a truth for everyone, mm. and it's not everyone's personal circumstance. Yeah, it's important to keep that perspective, isn't it? It's like you know, this is actually just the first bit of probably thirty or forty years of a career in this industry, and so you know, even if it takes a little bit longer, um, those those opportunities will will probably come. Um. Erica, so this next question talks about the uncertainty of everything going on right now. Um, so there's still so much uncertainty right now that I feel like I'm one decision not going my way away from crisis. If I lose my job, I can't afford my house, can't feed my kids, I've got no savings. I'm okay at the moment, but what if? It keeps me up at night and distracts me during the day. How do I cope? So I was going to say, the moment I hear what if, my worry radar is already going um, yeah. out of control. So I think it's important to acknowledge kind of up front that humans at the best of times don't deal with uncertainty well. We are kind of beings that try and create meaning. We try and plan the future. We make We try and kind of see the world as a lot more in control than it probably actually is. And I think the pandemic has pulled out the rug from underneath us all. Um, if you do have that propensity to worry, that uncertainty tends to get magnified in terms of the impact it has on you. So I think when things are uncertain, if you're kind of naturally a bit more of a worrier, you tend to go to those worst case scenarios where there's, where there's a gap. So instead of seeing that uncertainty as an opportunity or a potentially positive thing or a neutral thing, you'll go straight to that worst case scenario. Um, and generally when we're dealing with that kind of anxiety, worry, flavour, there's the kind of likelihood that these things are going to happen blowing out of proportion and then there's an impact of these things blowing out of proportion. So I kind of noticed in the question there was this kind of sequential boom, 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 boom of events. And so there's kind of this assumption that if you lost your job, then you'd lose, you know, that would impact your marriage. You wouldn't be able to feed your kids. You'd be out on the street. And that's kind of how worry tends to cycle is it tends to hook onto one little thing and then it really kind of snowballs until you're out on the street, nobody loves you and it's, you know, the world is terrible. So often the key is actually just really building awareness of when your mind is starting to do that spiralling and, and the fact that it's not helpful. So worry kind of sticks around because it feels like it's helpful. It feels like by imagining all these scenarios you're pre-planning for the future but actually what it does is it just tends to elevate the anxiety over a much longer period of time so some little things that you can do when you're noticing your mind to start to spiral is just really quickly triage them 
So kind of say, is there anything I can do about this right now? And if there's nothing you can do about it right now, kind of giving yourself permission to go, well, okay, I'll, I'll deal with it if it happens, when it happens. There's nothing I can do to change that outcome now, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, another thing is to kind of write your worries down and just kind of allow yourself to come back to them later, make a little slot, 10 minutes, 15 minutes at each day to kind of let yourself really indulge these things, but then kind of give yourself permission to move on for the rest of the day. So if you pop, if they pop into your mind during the day, quickly jot it down and then you can come back and really look them in the face later on. Um, mindfulness skills can help. So a lot of mindfulness, it's not really about relaxation, but it's just about developing an awareness of um, how you're thinking and how you're feeling and how that's impacting you. So the mindfulness skills just help you build that awareness of noticing when your brain's taken over and it's really not helping you as well. Um, and another really good trick is to talk yourself, talk to yourself like you would a friend. So it's really unlikely that we would ever talk to our friends in the same way we talk to ourselves. So it's really unlikely you'd sit down with a friend and you go, oh, I'm really worried about my job. And you go, yeah, I think you're doomed. I think your wife's going to leave you, your kids are going to be out on the street. But that, that tends to be how we talk to ourselves. So I think sometimes just actually going, well, what would I tell a friend in that situation? And it's probably pretty sage advice. It's probably like, well, you know, deal with it when you need to deal with it. You've got people who will support you. You know, even if it's not perfect, you'll probably be okay. So I think really talk to yourself um, as a friend. And if the worry and the anxiety is really impacting kind of, your work, your sleep, your relationships, like this is something that this is one of those good times to talk to a psychologist or um, I know, Andy, I kind of gave you a link to the free MindSpot program. So MindSpot's got a program for dealing with anxiety and it's all kind of evidence-based. You get support from a psychologist online, so kind of phone or, or via email. So little programs like that just teach you really good skills for identifying the worries and then kind of dealing with those worries in the moment. So, and you, run else <laughs> and you run a business in the middle of the pandemic. I mean, there must be some uncertainty creeping into your your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, firstly, I thought that the Erica's thing about um, talking to yourself like a friend. I think that's brilliant. That's uh, yeah, that's a great one. And then yeah, Andy. I mean, even going back from before we started the agency, uh, this question really resonated with me because uh, I, you know, I could have written it a couple of years ago. I got made redundant a couple of years ago, and uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I know exactly you know the, the way this the way this question has been worded and written. I know what that's like. That kind of negative mind spiral, and you know the three a.m. in the morning lying there awake, all of that stuff. It's mm -hmm. awful. The way um, the way I found was really helpful for me was. Um, surrounding myself with positivity um and the way i did that was i just kind of reactive or activated or reactivated my community of uh friends colleagues um ex-colleagues and so on um and just started uh, just reached out to a bunch of people to you know obviously to talk about work opportunities but also just to kind of reconnect and um yeah i mean people are just amazing people are just awesome that 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 process that, that could have been one of the most um you know, depressing low moments of my life actually ended up being so energizing and so positive that, you know, the people who just kind of said, oh, come in, let me buy you lunch, let's have a drink, come in and do some freelance. I, I, we haven't got a job, but we'll just make a job for you. Just, you know, it was just um, so uplifting. I mean, I just think people are people are amazing. I mean, like, Andy, you doing this this thing, this asking for a friend thing. I mean, it's just such an inspiring positive thing i was saying to you before just going back looking at some of the sort of previous episodes um i think the things that are just so helpful and inspiring the things that people will do when you kind of reach out and say look i need a chat or i need a hand or you know i'm in a bit of a spot here i've got maybe redundant or whatever it may be was just um i just found that so uplifting and so helpful that it got me into a good mind space that then got me to the point where i thought okay i can, I can actually we can um, we can launch an agency if i tried to launch an agency in the mind space I was initially that, that, you know, that, that wouldn't have gone very far. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So before we ask the last uh, question that came in beforehand, just a reminder to everyone that there is the questions tab. There are a couple of questions in there. You can also upvote the questions to make sure that we definitely uh, get to them, but please, if you've got one and you're just holding back um, and you're not quite sure, don't worry. They're all anonymous. We can, uh, we can help you out with that. So, and, the last question came in specifically for you. So. 
your your mug being on the uh, on the ad for the event. So, question for Ant: Do you have any tips on how to crank the creativity when you're working remotely with your team? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, yeah. I've got some thoughts on this, um, and for, mainly because um, I really struggle. If I'm honest, um, I really struggle with the whole remote thing. I, I, I didn't sort of, I didn't get into this industry or start an agency to be sitting on my on my own at the kitchen table all day. That's kind of not, that's not my jam. Um, I want to be. I got into this to be surrounded by smart, interesting, funny people who are doing great things and making funny comments, and uh, that's kind of that's what kind of. Uh, you know, it makes me get out of bed and come to the office in the morning. To so, so to suddenly have that taken away, and I've got to sit at the table on my own. Um, it sucks. I'm with you. Um, and it's and when you're in that kind of more negative mindset, it can be hard to be creative. So, some of the things I've um, that I've tried that I've found helpful are when I have been working remotely. I really like uh, as an agency, we re we're really into the Google sort of shared working thing, the Google Docs thing. So. Um, it's a little bit like the 2020 version of sitting there with a creative partner in a room, staring at your shoes and waiting for someone to say something good, uh, you know. Um, but if just working on a Google Doc together, and I can just see the way um, we've got a brilliant um, copywriter here called Lewis. And uh, if I'm sort of working on something with him, I'll just see the way his mind's working because he'll be tapping out a headline. And then I'll be thinking, oh, that's a bit crap. And then he'll delete it and then write a better one. Like, oh, wow, this is all this creativity is happening in real time. Or, you know, you can add a word or a comment and... Uh, it's not as good as kind of being in a room together, but I do like that kind of um, that Google shared working sort of real time thing. Um, I find um, for remote working short sprints better than long three, four hour stretches. Just uh, sometimes we'll, I'll just say to the team, look, let's um, this is what we need to do. We need to write these headlines or get this script written or have an idea for whatever it may be. Uh, let's just all go away for uh, 45 minutes then come back and we'll all have like a bucket of stuff and then we'll all share it and kind of um you know throw it around a little bit so I quite like the a bit on your own and then a bit together thing seems to work really well um i think um taking a break is really really important don't get stuck in the which i did right at the start of this pandemic i'd sort of get there in the morning and then do our morning status meeting and then um look at the time and think, oh, I've been sitting here for like three and a half hours and I've not moved. You know, don't don't get into that one. Get around, you know, standing up, walking around, you know, um, walk around the block or whatever it may be while you're sort of chewing on a problem. Um, and then I think also just making sure that you're, a, you're filling your mind with inspiration as ever. I mean, I'm sure you, you are or you should be as a, as a creative person um, doing that. But when, the, when your kind of frame of reference is four walls or has kind of been closed down a bit, just I think um, for me, the books, the films, um, you know, the Bruce Springsteen records have become more, more important than ever. Um, you know, just to, just to make sure you're getting that... Um, you're getting that inspiration and you're feeding your mind and that bank is full of different sort of fresh inspiration and reference to kind of, you know, to be uh, jumping off to, uh, to have ideas. Uh, Cause I think um, one of the, one of the phrases that has stuck with me uh, sort of through this period has been the whole, um, how did someone put it? It's not like you're working from home. It's like you're living at work. Um, and that is, yeah, that's quite a grim sort of a, a grim thought. So I think, you know, that to me just really reminds me, God, it's doubly important to get out, you know, to take that walk, to do a little bit of exercise, to, to, um, to get, you know, like I said, sneak it, sneaking off to the cinema, cheeky little two hour meeting in your diary. And then, you know, I had one where I went to see, um, don't know if anyone's seen Tenet, the, um, Christopher Doyle film. Um, but yeah, while you're sort of, while your mind's, uh, wrangling with two hours of crazy Christopher Doyle, what is going on in Tenet, you, you know, you're not stressing and you're not thinking about other problems or maybe you're, you are know, uh, subconsciously thinking about the problem, but just being able to switch off in those ways I find really helpful. That's so yeah. true. I, I um, guess what, I'm, I'm doing reruns of 24 at the moment, <laughs> which is like, it's great just to just stick an episode on, you know, just to take a break. Um, but it's interesting as well, like what you said, like the Google Doc thing, um, because I've, you know, I've, collaborating with people remotely and sometimes just yeah watching other people work it's actually also quite a nice thing for yeah. more of the introverted creatives because everyone sort of the like the 
the level of voice is just brought down to everybody's level. Mm. Uh, and I, yeah, watching people jump around a Figma document or a Google Doc. Um, we were right at the beginning of Never Not Creative. We created this thing called the um, the Never Not Creative Pledge, and it started as a Google Doc. And I remember sometimes just sitting in a cafe one morning and just watching all these people jump in and like adding stuff into the pledge and what they thought and that kind of stuff. And it's it it is actually quite energizing as yeah. well. Yeah, um, yeah, a, a mix, I guess, rather than having it forced upon us would be would be mm. good. Um, anything you want to add, Erica? Just going to go when you uh, start writing jokes for each other in the Google Documents, just make sure you delete them before yeah. you finalize the version, because I think sometimes we'll play games with each other in the Google Docs, and then you kind of mm. go, "Well, yeah, let's just make sure that that one's deleted before we send that to anyone outside." Yeah. But um, I think in terms of that creativity, it's the stuff I think remotely that you take advantage of in the office, you kind of just need to force a little bit more. Like that team building, that psychological safety is really important for creativity. Like you want to know that if you put out a wild idea that you're not going to get shot down. And I think sometimes that emerges really naturally when you're around each other, but when you're in a virtual environment, you kind of have to work a little bit harder to make that happen. So if you're investing in a strong team and a really good dialogue within your team, then it kind of creates an environment where creativity can blossom. And everything you said, Ant, about taking breaks and looking after yourself and probably the other one to add on top is make sure you get your sleep. So there's actually so much evidence to say mm. seven to nine hours sleep, particularly that end bit, is kind of when creativity is born. So if you're getting less than six hours sleep, you're kind of missing out on that really juicy bit when new ideas just happen. So I think that, you know, even things like the periodic table apparently just came in a dream and it all made sense. So feeding your brain, making sure you're taking the breaks, but then just getting the sleep to kind of click it all into place is really helpful. All right. Let's jump to uh, the next question. So this one's come in uh, live. So as a budding communications creative, I recently graduated from university and have been taking a mental health break from life and the job hunt. Do employers mind if I haven't gone straight into full-time work? How should I explain this break to minimize any judgment? Let's go to you first, Ant, um, just because this person could quite easily come to you for a job tomorrow and you see the break on their uh, CV. Like, what's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I don't know if this question's come from someone who's sort of just about to get into the industry or just in that sort of the starting of their career and then they've got, they're worried about this little break. Um, like not a problem whatsoever like um personally and most creative directors that i know and sort of um ecds and agency owners and so on on the, on the creative side I, I don't really care what's on your on your resume or your cv what you did from 2002 to 2006 or whatever or maybe that's some interesting stuff that we can talk about to get to know you more um but it's just more about what um what thinking are you bringing? What's you know? What's your background? What ideas you're bringing? What's in your portfolio? That's obviously a representation of the, like the way you think, um, like the numbers and the stats and the like this year to this year. It's just not. It is in some industries, I guess, but in this industry, it's it, it's irrelevant. Hmm. Erica, yeah, I'd I'd second that. It's it comes down to your narrative, and as you tried to explain who I am, introducing me, like sometimes. CVs just don't make sense until you explain the story about what you're passionate about and why you've gone on things. And, yeah, I've had big chunks of life out for gap years and people have time out for children, people have time out for caring, and you kind of don't need to go into a lot of detail. But I think, yeah, as you say, Anne, it's kind of having a narrative about who you are, why you're the person for the job, what skills you bring, Um and, you know, if it does come up in conversations, it's reframing it as a positive. Like I know I, I know me and I look after me when I, you know, you kind of get me in a self-sufficient bundle. When I need help, when I need support, I've got it. Um, I, I think that's great advice. Like, um, And that is the narrative that you should use. It is the fact that, you know, what you've been able to recognise when you've needed a break and you've taken it and, you, you know, lots of people don't. And, you know, as a result, you know, things can actually be even, even worse. So the fact you've you know, you're able to kind of be in control of you um and that you know you is is a great thing so yeah I, yeah should be, should be fine i just you just reminded me eric i was sort of thinking of um 
on, on, on multiple occasions kind of interviewing people, females uh, who have sort of come in for a chat about a job and then have sort of had different attitudes to the fact that uh, I took two years off here or there was a, there's a, there's a, a couple of period, a years break here um, where I went to have kids. And some people are like a bit sheepish about it and like, oh, I wasn't in the industry. And some people are just very proud of it. Um, I, I always see that when that, that specific thing, when there was a break to have kids, I'm just like, wow, tell me about that. What was that like? Imagine all the, the amazing new experiences and different perspectives you've got from that, um, you know, from that, that period of time. Like, tell me about it. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of excited about that. I, you know, I don't think people would ever be thinking, oh, but you weren't doing like the same thing for two, you know, it's just not, it's not relevant. It's like another opportunity, like you say, to, um, you know, to make your narrative even more interesting. Yeah. So that is actually an amazing segue into a question that was already in there. Oh. Um, so here is it. This is in two parts, this question. Um, I don't have a child, will never have one, and I have so much respect for people with children. I feel that those who have children are given more leeway and empathy to get some time off to get things sorted at home. I've always felt that the child is an excuse used that shuts out any further questions. I may need to get things sorted at home as well, or I may just need some space for my mental health that isn't child related. Is there a way to get both sides on equal footing or for us childless people to have the same empathy that I feel is given to those who have children? Erica, I gave Ant the, <laughs> <laughs> the first one last time. So, uh. I was going to say, I'm going to answer with my mum hat on. Yeah. And I think any time I get time off, for children is because you kind of don't have a choice and you ask for it. So it's not a waiting for you to give it to me. It's not a negotiation. It's like they've vomited all over the floor. You know, I'm out, guys. So I'm wondering if part of it is not waiting for the world around you to change, but actually you stepping up to ask for what you need when you need it in a really clear way. So I think if you're really clear on your boundaries, um, you know, I'm just wondering if it's the external world saying you don't have a reason to do it or whether it's something where you're not feeling you've got a sufficient reason or you're not backing yourself with what you need enough to ask for it. So, um, you know, I've definitely had people in work kind of say, I need time out for older parents to, you know, renovate a house because the plumbing's broken there's often a lot of things that come up in life and it's probably just putting your hands up and having that really clear conversation. Um, you can detect a theme. I'm pretty blunt in my, <laughs> in my world and my life. And would you kind of go at it another way? No, no, I pretty, I pretty much agree with that. The first thing I'd agree with, with is just to be clear, just on the, just the logistics of parenthood. I've got two kids, like just sometimes logistically parents need, time to do whatever it may be child related stuff taking them to um you know parent teacher events or taking kids to places or kids are sick or whatever so i think that's just kind of a given that that kind of um, needs to be allowed for i think um our um i don't want to sort of be plugging our agency too much but the, the sort of the principles that we founded this place on are um around Everyone in the industry talks about the work, the work, the work, the work, the work's so important, you know, the work's the most important thing. And it is, and I'm not sort of disagreeing with that, but our, our take on it is that um, the work comes from the culture and the people are the culture. So if you don't, if you haven't got a culture where people are um, happy and energized and engaged and comfortable and all of the things, then like the work won't come out the other end anyway. So our, our kind of agency sort of slogan is people are everything. And um, yeah, like whether that's um, whether people, any of those people that are in the team need time or space or whatever it may be for kid related things or any other related thing. I think it's like you just said, Erica, it's just um, uh, a sensible grown up sort of conversation about, um, you know, we need, you know, whether it's with me or with agency leaders to just say, look, I just need some space for. Um, you know, whatever it may be, to you know, to care for my elderly parents or to just take some space for my my mental health. Um, and I don't know, I can't speak for the industry, obviously, but I, I am totally open to that. I can't. I think um, hopefully we're tra we're probably not perfect yet, but we're definitely sort of evolving away from a uh, an industry where everyone's got to be in you know twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, and you know if you don't turn up on Saturday, don't bother turning up on Sunday, and all that sort of nonsense. 
Um, yeah. And I think things like this, this asking for a friend series are kind of contributing to helping with that. Um, but yeah, hopefully like the question asker, the, the, the person who asked the question um, and other people that are in that sort of um, that kind of situation, I think it's like less about comparing yourself with people that have got kids and more about kind of thinking, well, what's right for me? What do I need? And how do I articulate that in a, in, in the right way? Yeah. yeah. And I think another piece of advice that you kind of just really prompted and is this kind of idea of your boundaries. Like it's almost like work will always be there and work will always want more. So at some point you have to decide what you know what's your thing and I think kids just make it easy because they don't give you a choice they just kind of are and you have to so I think for you it's probably a trickier determining of your boundaries around like when do I need to take a break and what do I need yeah yeah definitely they're, they're, they're great answers I think um so I know Anne you have to go at five minutes because the world doesn't stop <laughs> Asking Sorry, for a friend, unfortunately. So there's two there's two questions I think we can get through. Uh, so the first one is, this is definitely towards you, Ant. Um, working from home means we no longer have face to face meetings, and briefs are coming in via email, discussed via Zoom. What are some things that account service can do to make briefs inspiring for creatives when working from home? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so this is a question from an account service person, yeah. by the sounds of things. Yeah, um, I think. Um, um, all of the things that have always made sort of a, a great brief and a great, a great approach to account service, which is, you know, clarity, making it clear, all the right information, not too long, you know, anything in my, in my mind, anything longer than sort of two sides of A4 or two pages, I guess, on an, on an email is just, is, is too much, but then backed up with all the information that, um, that is needed, uh, you know, all the, you know, the research or the reference or whatever it may be. Um, and I've always been one of the, I know not everyone is kind of a fan of working this way, but I've always kind of thought the briefing uh, moment is as important as the brief itself. So how do you do that in a Zoom world is, is really difficult. But I think um, I really appreciate it when um, our account service team have clearly put like the time into getting that brief right. Um, have put um we'll get on the zoom and be sort of ready to sort of talk through to ask questions to sort of share their sort of initial sort of ideas and to sort of to share references to just kind of kick things off in a way that sort of sets us up for success um so yeah i mean i've got no silver sort of no magic silver bullet really but i would just say like now more than ever for the account service team to be like really invested and involved in that process versus like you know the opposite of that which would be you know hit send and then wait two days kind of thing yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. If you need to go, Ant, do you want to? Do you want to go now? Or are you you're all right for a couple of minutes? Don't mind. I'm all right for a couple of minutes, but yeah, I, I don't mind. It's up, it's up to you. What do you reckon? Question for Erica, really, Nick. What do you think? You can this answer is, first, and I'll fill in. <laughs> okay, let's do that. So this next question: um, A senior designer asked to do something she didn't want to do, stood in the middle of the studio, and screamed at the manager. The manager requested they continue the conversation in private, but the real damage was studio morale. It plummeted. How do you address the fallout in the studio? That's such a real question, isn't wow. it? Wow, that's visceral, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, that's a real, yeah. Happened. This afternoon, and yeah, this is a great one to get sort yeah. of the two sides of the, the sort of the creative sort of industry side and then the, the professional side. Um, how do you what was the, the end of the question though, Andy? How do you address, do you address the, the studio? Out the studio? I guess it's going to it really starts to affect culture when that happens, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, God, this is a really hard question and obviously a really tricky situation. I, I think, um, like I mentioned before about people, our, our thing being around people or everything, um, I think that the start of that and also like linked to the other question that the person, the child, the, the non-child person sort of was asking is around um, just being speaking and being really open and honest with people's feelings versus like the other way to do it, which is to kind of sweep it all under the carpet and sort of go, Oh, that was a bit weird. Anyway, crack on everyone. Um, I, I would rather be from the camp that says, okay, look, this has happened. Let's get the people who were kind of upset or sort of screaming at each other. Um, after a bit of cooling off period, obviously to kind of, uh, come together and have a kind of a, a discussion. Let's kind of bring the whole, um, try and get to the bottom of that let's bring the whole team the whole design team or creative team uh, you know together to say look this happened uh, it probably wasn't cool 
this, these are the reasons um, this person's ended up in this space, but it's probably not that person's fault. There's probably a whole sort of series of underlying sort of issues that have gone on. Um, and uh, me personally, as a leader of a creative department, I'd be wanting to address those um, address those underlying reasons and and then share with the team how I've addressed them and how we've addressed them and how we're going to you know hopefully build a uh, you know build a, a different culture ongoing. But I suppose my main thing would be to be just sort of find a way in, in the appropriate way to just be really open and honest about it rather than sweeping it under the carpet. Okay. Erica, how did he do? <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. You nailed all the right things. So I think, you know, it's a great, one thing that is actually really amazing is that good relationships happen in how you respond to bad things happening, if that makes sense. So it's not a perfect team relationship if everything's rosy all the time, but it's how you recover from that stuff. So the morale deck is probably, a little bit of a blip if you can manage it well and and if you can kind of address those issues that went into the background you know will workloads unreasonable are we having an issue with delegation is the communication not clear is someone not taking breaks and then they're just burnt out and responding if you if your team can see you dealing with that and kind of recovering from that morale is actually going to go even higher than where it was before so it's more in the recovery um but I think it's also a really good opportunity to recheck the values of the organisation by having that open conversation about it's terrible, it's happened, here's what we're doing, but also kind of setting that expectation of, well, you know, as an organisation, that's not who we want to be or, you know, we want people raising things before they're an issue or this is not behaviour we're going to accept, you know, people yelling at each other. So I think it's a really good opportunity to use it as a learning experience to kind of make the team stronger. I love that thing about um, an opportunity to sort of uh, stress test the values of the organisation as well because like I keep talking about our people are everything thing and lots of agencies have got their own sort of set of values that are written down in an employee handbook and on the wall and it's kind of this is where the rubber hits the road I, I, you know are you going to just have those things just written down as words that you kind of talk about or are you actually going to live those values it's in these these difficult moments that it kind of all comes to life doesn't it Definitely. It also really rationalizes it as well, doesn't it? It's like, you know, you can take it back to something that was core rather than, you know, he said, she said, or that that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, right. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. That was amazing. And some really great questions. Like, I really appreciate people sending in some of those that were really quite specific and, and real. Um, amazing advice from uh, Erica and Ant. Thanks so much for giving up your, your time today. Um, thank you no, thanks for doing it Andy it's thanks really for important. having us yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah thanks so much yeah and thanks to everyone for jumping on yeah it's yeah it's been great I've really enjoyed it it's been fun yeah it's been Got great to do it again <laughs> Re recap a couple of things that, that came up I think that worth just remembering so when you're a new manager don't take credit give credit you know that's your time to help other people start to, to rise up um, very clearly sexual harassment is not okay and the first thing you can do if you're not getting the support you need is reach out to 1-800-RESPECT. Um, the uncertainty thing and the constant worry and anxiety is like just be really honest with yourself and um, you know work out is there anything you can do right now and um, let's see whether you know if there isn't just put it to the side write it down move on um, and address it when when you can. Um, keep creative you know you've got to take breaks to keep creative you can't just slog it out every day and especially if work has turned into um where life is then uh, Andy, i'm so sorry to jump in I, i'm going to jump off. i don't want you to rush the end bit so i'm going to jump off and say bye but thank you so much thank you yeah. so much i'll see you so hopefully in real life yeah, yeah. thanks yeah. everyone all right um, and then the final one is i, I think we would finished on um what you were talking about then erica which was like those big moments, I can tell you, I've had that happen to me in the studio. Um, I wasn't involved in it, but I watched literally someone jump across the desk at somebody else. And I'll be honest, like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, what? Like, I, I know that's not okay behavior in this environment, but clearly something's happened. Um, and, you know, looking back on it, I don't think I particularly would have handled it well and i wish i had the advice that you just give gave which was um how do you turn that fallout into something that's actually an opportunity to look back at values what we want to stand for how that aligns with what culture we want to build and then ultimately um make it even stronger so i think that was that was really really good really awesome thank you yeah all that right was really good fun very good thank you everyone yeah. for 
for listening, joining. This will go online in probably a couple of days. Um, so you'll be able to check it out at nevernotcreative.org. And um, we'll be back the first Thursday of next month. So thank you very much again. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks for hosting. Bye.